AI can improve learners' decision-making skills. True or false? I'd say that's some of both. <laughs> in some cases, true, in other cases, false. <laughs> Education is losing its primary role of learning provision. True or false? I think that's false. I think education is, still remains a tremendously important aspect of improving lives. The biggest issue with current education system is the professional development of teachers. True or false? Sort of true, but there's lots of other factors that also matter a great deal. Welcome to the 41st episode of the Skills Factory. Talks and ideas about skills from Europe and beyond. Today we have a privilege to have Karl Weimann, Professor of Physics and of Education at Stanford University, Nobel Prize in Physics. Thank you for joining us today, Karl. Welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Karl, could you tell us what was your educational story? How did it go for you in school? So mine was a little bit unusual, but I, you know, during high school I was interested in science and so on, but I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Then I went to college, I went to MIT, and there I was fortunate enough, even as a first year student, to start working in a research lab. And I found that was so much more rewarding and interesting than taking classes that I spent all my college career spending as little time taking classes as possible and as much time as possible in a research lab. And so that was really dominated my own personal educational experience. And what was that in that lab that attracted you? It was that you were figuring out how the world worked and sort of understanding it. Whereas in classes, It seemed like all you were trying to do was learn to think how the instructor wanted you to think, <laughs> whereas whereas in the lab, you were really figuring out the mysteries of nature. And that just seemed such a much more interesting challenge. When you became a teacher yourself, was it as successful, your experience as a teacher, as the experience as a learner? No, I mean, my experience. Experience as a teacher was I'm always a, a hardcore experimentalist. And so I like to do experiments and look at the evidence, whether it's physics or even in teaching. So when I started teaching, I that was at the University of Michigan and didn't really know what to do, but I thought, well, I can look and see how different faculty do it and see, you know, what's better by looking at that. And it there was an easy opportunity for an experiment there because we had these big introductory physics classes where they had small sections and all the different faculty taught the small sections, but they had a standard final exam. So I thought, well, I'll just look at how students do it in their final exam, which section seems to be best. And I still remember being struck by those results and that even though there were some faculty who clearly paid almost no attention. Students did almost exactly the same on the exams. And the only thing that seemed to matter is what time of day. The early in the morning wasn't very good. <laughs> so that was an eye-opening experience for me. And I mean, just getting ahead of myself, now I understand why, is that basically some of them kind of paid more attention to the effort but none of them really knew how to teach. They were all just talking to the students. And so it was all what we now know is really a very ineffective way. Of so talking doesn't teach, right? That's right, yes. What does then? I think the, the basic principle, and I think this is really the fundamental change we need in education, just to think about learning in a different way, because I think the sort of pervasive and traditional way is to think about learning as you have these student brains and they're in your class and you're filling up those brains with knowledge. And the brains are just sort of fixed things that you pour knowledge into by telling them stuff. And that's just wrong. <laughs> and the right way to think about it is that the brains are changeable. And that good teaching is really transforms the brain so that it has new capabilities. But to transform the brain, you have to have that brain practicing the thinking you want it to learn. And so instead of telling people knowledge, you want them to have practice 
getting guidance and thinking and the kind of learning that you want them to adopt. And that's really much more effective. And our the big change needed is really to just change that basic paradigm of thinking about how learning is achieved. Do you have the feeling that learning sometimes perceived as something that should be light and easy process, but not only by learners, also by teachers. And instead, it's not that light, actually. It, it can be rather complex. It's certainly complex, but it's also hard work. I mean, that's one thing that studies have shown very clearly, and it sort of makes sense, is that real learning, you have to think very hard at. <laughs> and so you have to put in a lot of mental effort. And I think people don't have all the biological details in place, but I think it's sort of pretty clear that if you're thinking very intently, you're making more changes in the neurons. They they are changed how they're hooked up in better ways. And that achieves the brain transformation, the learning that you need. And so there's really no substitute for a lot of effort. That means that one of the educational challenges is how do you convince people it's worth put in that effort. Education systems are good in communicating that message that there is a lot of hard work behind the learning. I do think that lots of teachers try and send the message that you need to work hard to be successful. I think probably the place where they fail more at is trying to think how to present the material in such a way as not just to tell people it's hard work, but to convince them the value in that hard work, you know, and how they can feel more satisfied at mastering things they couldn't do before and just having challenges and succeeding at them and understanding why the material will serve them, you know, other purposes later in life and or even at present rather than just things you have to memorize because the teacher says this and it's going to be on the exams. In fact, coming back to the memorization, in one of your interviews, uh, you said that education is about learning how to make better decisions. How do you reconcile this uh, with traditional education, where often you have to memorize stuff? My group has studied expertise across science and engineering. And one of the things we've seen is that expertise in these fields is, is about solving problems. That's what you do if you're an engineer or a scientist, you're solving new problems new problems, but we've seen their problem solving process. It's really based on a set of specific decisions. We identified 29 of them that they make in solving problems. And we found that those same decisions hold really for solving problems, even as a very beginning student, you need to make those similar kinds of decisions. And, you know, I don't want to go through the whole list, but the things about Thinking, you know, recognizing what information is relevant and applying that information in the suitable times, you know, questioning how to find information, how reliable it is, and so on. And also sort of checking your own assumptions and the way you're solving. <laughs> and so those are good things in, in general to have kind of in life. Do you think that our teachers in current education system are ready for the shift in paradigm? That's a good question because the shift really needs to be okay. Instead of telling students knowledge, I need to have them practicing making decisions and getting feedback on those decisions to try and improve that. And clearly most of the teachers don't recognize that and need to kind of rethink it. But I do think you can't just blame it on the teachers. I mean, I think sort of in society larger, the administrators and the teachers that went to evaluate them, even the parents so often still have this obsolete view about learning. And, you know, yes, the teachers need to change, but there's other factors too. Do you think this change should come from bottom up? So from learners asking and making specific requests, or it will go with the reform of the whole education system? I think it's got to be the reform of the whole education system, like I say. I mean, I think the the issues are so broad at some level. There's many stakeholders in this that have to be kind of convinced and come along. You are the founder of PHET, Fat Interactive Simulation Project, and this project creates free interactive math and science simulations. 
it's kind of a game like environment, right? Where people can learn through hands on experience. What was the rationale behind this project? So, first, I have to put in a plug for saying how successful it's been. It's now used almost a million times a day all over the world in 65 different languages. So, it's been impressive, really impressive. Way beyond what I started, it's other people have made it successful. But the way it started actually was I was involved in another project where I was working with some computer programmers in trying to present my physics research and showing that I could do some simple computer simulations that sort of showed our own representation. And, you know, it was Arctic cartoons showing atoms and light and so on. And so very artificial, but but I found it tremendously effective at teaching people and engaging. And it worked for an enormous range of audiences. I could use it with middle school students. I could use it with physics professors. And they all sort of found this, this useful. I think one of the important aspects to it is as a learner, you can explore on your own. So and again, instead of just having someone tell you how things happen, you can sort of ask yourself questions about, you know, if I change the color of that light, how is that atom going to change differently? And you can do that experiment and see what happens. And so that gives you much more kind of control over the learning process. I think that's a valuable thing. Do you think that one of the best way to learn is to do the self-guided learning? So no teachers at all, and you do it by your own? I think we have good evidence that that doesn't work. You have to have guidance from a good teacher. And so you need a teacher to really identify what are the key ideas and the key problem-solving decisions that are involved in mastering this, and then creating good practice tasks for that. So the learner is still making the decisions on their own, but the teacher has to kind of create the practice decisions for them because it's just too much to expect the student to do that. So the teacher really has a very important role there. And then the other very important role is people need good feedback on they practice, you know, whether it's athletics or playing music or thinking about science. You can practice it on your own, but you really need help in sort of knowing how to improve. In ETF, we have a, an international community comprised of hundreds and hundreds of STEM educators coming from all over the world. What specific message would you give to all those educators? The main message I try and transmit is this basic principle of how learning works and how it's really the development of the brain, <laughs> and that the great majority of learner brains are capable of actually learning a great deal. And you have to treat them as having that capability and then given the appropriate practice to, to master it. Please subscribe to this show on all platforms and stay tuned. One of the hot potatoes of this podcast is the role of artificial intelligence. What will be the impact of artificial intelligence on education? I think that's really a, a major outstanding question that lots of people, including my own research group, are thinking about, wondering about. And I don't think anybody really has the answers yet. I think at the most basic level, it's trying to figure out what it's going to mean to be an educated person in the world of artificial intelligence when a computer can do so many things that we sort of thought of as needed for competence in different areas. You know, that's the first and sort of most fundamental question is to figure out what the real learning is. Now, my own personal view, the thing that's still going to be important is making decisions particularly these kind of problem-solving decisions I'm talking about, always happen with limited information. So at some level, you're making just an educated guess. And I think computers are always going to be pretty bad at doing that. <laughs> and, and we see from some tests that we run that, you know, that they're good at doing things where you can look up lots of other people have done certain things. 
they know how to do it from that. But when it's something novel and you're kind of having to make a best guess based on your knowledge and skills, then they're not going to be very good at that. And so that's still going to be a place for people. And also creativity, thinking of novel ways to tackle problems. I mean, the again, these are trained on looking at how lots of other people have already done things. My group is actually studying different ways to use artificial intelligence in education. And we we're looking at it from sort of two sides of it. One is just the efficiency side. Can we use it for grading student work? So just taking away some of the time burden that teachers have to spend on that. And that's looking encouraging that we can have the reasonable grading. The other side that we're trying is, can it be a tutor that kind of helps guide students learn to make better decisions in some cases. And that's much more of a challenge. These so-called large language models are really based around giving answers. You know, a good tutor helping a student learn doesn't just give them the answer. That's not very useful. It's helping the learner understand what's wrong with their thinking and how to do it better. And so that's a much harder problem to get the AI to do that. And we have some very preliminary results that actually look like it can actually be useful in some aspects of that as sort of helping a student understand, for example, what concepts are particularly important and something about applying them. But it remains to be seen how practical it's going to be on a larger scale. I just don't know. You don't believe that teachers will be substituted, even partially, by AI? It's going to be a long time, is my feeling, yeah. And especially if you think about the role that I talked about with the, the really important aspects the teacher plays of designing practice problems and giving students really feedback on their thinking. Those are the things that AI is not very good at. <laughs> so, not yet, at least, we can say. Not, not yet. Yeah, I mean, that's the other thing. It, the technology changes so fast. People call it AI revolution. Do you perceive that fear or not? No, the main fear I've seen is actually just the fear of students using it for cheating on exams or homework problems, getting the answers. And that's the biggest concern, to be honest. And even in STEM, AI could help to cheat. Yeah. If the teacher's giving real world problems, AI is not nearly as good at solving those kind of problems, but the kind of standard artificial problems they give in textbooks, it's pretty good at solving those. And the same kind of problems are usually given on exams. Then the cheating would also mean that the evaluation assessment method should change. That's right. And people are busy thinking about that issue, actually, very, very immediately. <laughs> we did a little survey of college teachers' views about AI. And one of the interesting things was they just had wildly different views about what was appropriate for use, which makes it clear that for institutions to set policies that people agree on is going to be very difficult with such a wide range of opinions on what's good or bad. Carl, what is one most favorite things for you in teaching process or rewarding or the one that you enjoy the most? You know, when I enjoy the most really is to see the students have learned something, <laughs> you know. So I sort of say I'm not really excited about teaching per se. It's just satisfying when I see students really learn something and see value in that learning is to me the satisfaction. Do you ever find it difficult to motivate students? Yes. <laughs> How do you overcome this challenge? Motivating students, it's a really important issue, but it's its very hard. It depends very much on the student's background experiences, you know, and finding a way to connect up with what they see as important and, and worthwhile. And, you know, I think from research, we know a few things that are important, really. First, trying to make the material relevant and interesting to the learner and, you know, what's relevant and interesting to one learner from their background can be very different from another. So that's always a challenge. 
also, it's important for motivation for the learner to believe they can learn the material and how to go about learning it. And so they get satisfaction from that process. I've been really struggling with this, particularly recently, because I've been teaching at the very first college physics course, and I developed a special course for students who come in to college with less preparation in physics than the sort of normal student. Because in our research, we found that students' incoming preparation was a very strong predictor of how well they did in their college physics class. The traditional class was really penalizing students who usually come from less economically well-off school districts, and so they don't get as good physics, and then they really suffer in college. So I'm, it's a required course for all the engineers that will sort of work, make up for these students who aren't very well prepared. You know, motivating them, it just reminds me of the realities. <laughs> I will say it has been successful when we think very carefully about So it works, but it's difficult. In one of our recent podcasts, we discussed the most valuable skills for today and for the future. I think you've mentioned today two, uh, problem solving and um, analytical thinking. Is there any other skill you believe is super important? Creativity, sort of, you know, being able to think of novel ways of doing things, I think are particularly important. During your career, did you ever find yourself in a situation when you could not figure out something? What did you do? I can think of situations like that that I was in. And, you know, one of the things that helped me and that still helped me was I look back on things that I thought were really hard and that I really spent a lot of time trying to figure out and that now I understand and they sort of make sense to me. But there were some things I remember my early days of trying to understand quantum field theory, which is a really advanced idea in, in physics. And this is just very hard for me to get my head around how the people were thinking about this. And so one of the things that I remember doing was just trying to find a lot of different books of different people writing their own explanations, trying to out of that composite, find sort of what would click for me in retrospect, now that I know more about learning. I think that's actually a, a really important step that you can spend a lot of time kind of being frustrated at not understanding something, but your brain is actually making progress. And then you eventually reach a point where suddenly it makes sense to you. As a quantum physics scientist, do you see the world differently? I think so. Yeah. I mean, you know, a lot of things you still perceive in much the same way. For me, it's really quite satisfying of looking at how things are functioning and understanding why it behaves that way. You know, and that I understand the, the underlying physics that explains, you know, why things are different colors, how my computer works, how the solar panels on my house work and so on. Today we had Carl Weiman, Professor of Physics and of Education at Stanford University, Nobel Prize in Physics. It was a great pleasure to talk to you, Carl. Thank you. Thanks. It was fun. Bye. And thanks to all of you, our listeners, and stay tuned as there is much more to come. Goodbye. <laughs>